Morag Margaret McNeil was born in Shanghai, China on November 12, 1948. Her parents were Iris Motu and Ronald Roy McNeil. Iris was born in Yokohama of Japanese, Swiss, French, and Dutch heritage, and Roy was from Glasgow, Scotland. In 1949, fleeing the communist takeover of Shanghai, the family emigrated to BC, where Morag's brother Keith was born in 1951. Morag was proud of her unique heritage, and in later life, traveled to Shanghai, Japan, and Scotland to see her ancestral homes. Growing up in Vernon with the unusual name of Morag sometimes led to teasing, however. Of course, being Morag, that made her more proud of her name. She would tell you that it was Gaelic, and it meant great, and sun, and star of the sea. She also said that the only person who actually knew how to pronounce it correctly was her father. A friend in Souk liked the name so much, he named a Highland cow heifer after her. You might have seen it in the slideshow. Morag also took pleasure in her recent discovery that she had a second Japanese great-grandmother, making her one-quarter Japanese instead of just one-eighth. Morag had a very happy childhood. She played with neighborhood kids, skipped grade two, something she's very proud of, belonged to brownies and girl guides, taught Sunday school, and went on to Vernon Junior High in 1960, where among other subjects, she developed a lifelong interest in science. Around this time, Morag tried to join the renowned Macintosh Girls Pipe Band, but was told she was too small to play the pipes. I'm very familiar with this problem. <laughs> of course, again being Morag, she persisted, and eventually they decided to let her in the band. Thus began her lifelong love affair with the bagpipes. The band performed and traveled extensively to California, the Calgary Stampede, and the PE. Back in the day, she might also spontaneously play at house parties, much to the annoyance of the landlords. <laughs> Morag attended Vernon Senior Secondary School and was on the student council and graduated in 1966. Her grad photo shows her with a very smart 60s bob a stylish pink dress, and white gloves. She started at UBC in 1966, but returned to Vernon in December when her father died unexpectedly. She started UVic in September 1967, embarking on the world's longest BA. It was finally awarded in 1994 with distinction and a major in psychology, a mere 27 years later, if you were doing the math. She attended UVic through the late 60s with a group of friends who took up residence in the sub and majored in bridge. In the summers, she worked at the Okanagan Telephone Company as a long distance operator, the perfect summer job for swinging 1960s girls. It not only paid well, but it enabled the Okanagan lifestyle, consisting of sunning, sun tanning at Kalamauka Lake and attending parties after evening shifts. In keeping with the spirit of the time, Morag dropped out of UVic in 1970 and started full-time work. By then, she had met Terry Watling, whom she married in August 1970 and subsequently divorced in 1979. After brief stints modeling and working at Sweet 16, Morag began working at the University of Victoria in 1971, the start of a 42-year career there. Beginning as an antiquarian bibliographic checker, I want you all to practice saying that later, she then worked as a stenographer in the Department of Mathematics, then secretary to UVic's first law librarian. In 1980, she moved to the Department of Psychology where she managed the office and much more for more than 20 years. Morag was referred to as the princess of quite a lot because there wasn't any problem she couldn't solve. Also in 1980, Morag met Stephen Hill. Both had strong and independent personalities, but together they forged a supportive and loving relationship for 39 years, marrying a few months ago in April of this year. Morag joined the office of the university secretary in 2005, serving as administrative manager for 10 years before retiring in 2016. She was also active in many organizations on campus over the years and served on multiple committees. 
When Morag retired, her boss, University Secretary Dr. Julia Eastman said, you have a really exceptional constellation of qualities, perceptiveness, thoughtfulness and compassion, strength and determination, treating everyone with kindness and respect. Your wisdom has been felt by many. After she retired, Morag worried that she would be bored and have nothing to do. Really? <laughs> Shocking. That, of course, proved wildly wrong as she flung herself into activities, volunteering, and a very engaged new chapter of her life. Her interests were many and diverse. She belonged to book clubs, the Saanich Peninsula Pipe Band, here they all are, sailed with Stephen, played bridge, was an excellent tennis and squash player, did yoga, attended the opera, although she admittedly sometimes not at all. She actually had a reputation for that in the book club as well. <laughs> Dance and theater, loved sports cars such as her Austin Healey and red BMW, and enjoyed cooking, sewing, and gardening. One of Morag's pleasures was finding a new recipe to try, which became an excuse for an impromptu dinner party. She would bring people together who sometimes had nothing in common other than knowing Morag, but the meals and conversation were always uh, rewarding and a delight. She was a very active community member. She volunteered with a senior support group, was a member of the Yacht Club, and belonged to the Victoria Nikai Cultural Society and the Ubik Whiskey Club, where she often piped in the haggis at the Robbie Burns Supper. Morag had cousins, aunts, and uncles who lived in Vancouver, California, Hong Kong, Scotland, and Geneva, Switzerland. As a teenager, she would take the bus from Vernon to Vancouver to visit her aunts, Cecile and Camille. And we all heard endearing stories of Cecile and Camille. Morag was a devoted aunt to her niece, Penny, and nephews, Tom and Ron. She also enjoyed being an auntie to Stephen's many nieces and nephews and Mitch and Ryder's children. She was incredibly soft-hearted and loved all creatures, big and small, especially cats, at least six of which she adopted from the SBCA, one of 12 charities that she supported. She once had Suzanne go with her to the pound and help her choose a cat because she was crying too hard to speak to the staff due to the plight of the poor kitties in the cage. True to form, she picked the scraggliest, most pathetic looking black cat, the almost unadoptable Missy. Morag's kindness even extended to earthworms. It was not uncommon to be walking with Morag only to discover she had stopped several paces back. If it had rained, and the earthworms were crawling across the sidewalk, Morag would patiently pick them up and put them back on the grass so that they wouldn't get stepped on by some uncaring or unobservant uh, pedestrian. She was also a woman of vision and strong determination. Once she got an idea in her head, it could grow into something that wasn't quite what it started out to be. A good example of this was the walking trip she took in 2017 with good friend Penny Margotson. Morag initially proposed an easy four-day stroll through the Cotswolds, which Penny quickly agreed to. But at Morag's behest, the trip morphed into an eight-day, 100-kilometer hike across Scotland on St. Cuthbert's Way. <laughs> Charmingly persuasive, Morag had altered the vision to a grander scale and persuaded Penny to carry it out with her. Perhaps Morag's most wonderful quality, one that shines through in the tributes posted on her obituary website, was her boundless capacity for friendship, which is why we're, in, we're here, because there's too many of us to be inside the building. She was a tremendously empathic listener and accepted people as they were. She was also funny as hell and a world-class laugher. I said this on her uh, website, her compassion and loyalty made her the best friend anyone could have, but she was also so much fun, and with her easy laughter being up for any adventure, and a good dram or two, and her many talents for uh, various different activities. Morag, uh, Heather, and I, and Marge went to Scotland together, and as we were flying over the Hebrides, coming in for the landing in Glasgow, Morag and I started crying, looking out the window. I turned to her and I said, why are we crying? And she said, I don't know. <laughs> and then we both started laughing hysterically. That is traveling with Morag and she was a kindred spirit. I'm sure Heather and Marge thought that we were crazy sitting behind us. 
Morag had endured cancer several times in her life, as far back as 1993. And Stephen has just discovered that she saved every single card that she received at that time. She was diagnosed with another very aggressive cancer in March 2019, which progressed so quickly that many plans and dreams were left unaccomplished. To the end, though, she was her usual self, positive, enjoying the company she was keeping, finding humor in almost any situation. A few days before she died, a friend who was visiting Morag asked her how she was doing. Her response was, I will get through this. Classic Morag, without fear, on her terms, and with grace. Maya Angelo said that people will forget what you said and forget what you did in life, but they will never forget how you made them feel. And our feelings for Morag bear this out. We loved her, and our grief is the price we pay for that love. And we are grateful for the very many memories she left us. We'll miss her terribly, but we also feel vor very fortunate to have known her. And by these or any other measures, I almost made it. <laughs> <laughs> Morag McNeil's life was indeed a life well lived. Thank you, Morag, for being part of our lives. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, I'd like to now call on the members of the family who'd like to make a move. Um, as many of you know, uh, I'm Stephen Hale, Morag's partner of 39 years, and Morag's husband as of April 6, 2019, when we were married. Initially, I didn't trust myself to say anything today, but I would be remiss if I didn't thank you for coming. In planning this event, I thought back through the years and of all the people who Morag connected with. I am pleased so many of you could be here today, and I know of many others who were unable to come and who sent their regrets. I'm not going to take the time to sing Morag's praises. I'm going to leave that to others. And you already know in your hearts what Morag meant to you. As I wrote in the pamphlet, perhaps Morag's greatest legacy is the fondness with which she is remembered by the many people who came to know her. Thank you for being here today to celebrate and honor the life of Morag. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, <clears throat> let me introduce myself. I am Louis Michel Machu of the family that uh, started in Yokohama, Japan, back in the turn of the century. A family Stonebrink, which is the Dutch part of our family, who was a Dutch engineer in Yokohama who built an ice factory to service the Japanese fishing fleet. And he married a Japanese lady and had a daughter. And that daughter married a Alfred Louis Matu, who was a black sheep of the Matu clan from Switzerland. And, and he was in Japan, uh, worked for the big Hong, as they call them, Jardine Matheson. And he was a sportsman, an exceptional scholar, as well as a horse rider. And he used to ride the racing horses of the director of the firm at the race horse races he married he had four children three girls Cecile Iris and Camille and a son Alfred Louis Louis Alfred Martin who is my father and I am the oldest cousin of Morag. I will be 80 years old next month. My grandfather, Alfred Rimatu, who worked in the silk department of Jardine uh, Matheson, decided to start his own firm. He did. And it only lasted a matter of a week <laughs> because the, the silk market crashed. Finally managed to get a job with British American Tobacco in uh, Shanghai. So he moved the family to Shanghai. That's where I was born. And as well as Morag. And I remember visiting them in 1948, shortly after Morag was born. And I carried 
her, she was the first infant I ever carried. And they left and came to Canada. So those are my fond memories of my cousin Moran. I would like to comment that um, the number of people here today uh, is a testament to Morag's wide range of interests, to the extensive number of friends that she developed over the years, and to the lasting impact that she will have on all of our lives. For me, Morag's legacy is captured in a haiku poem written by the 17th century Japanese poet Basho. He wrote, Breaking the silence of an ancient pond, a frog jumped into water, a deep resonance. And Morag will continue to resonate for many years ahead. So, over to you. Afternoon. My name is Murray Farmer. Uh, I had the great pleasure of working with Morag at the University of Victoria. Um, she was actually paid for her part. And uh, <laughs> originally it was through the uh, Board of Governors, who she was supporting through the Secretary's office. And then uh, a few years later, I was elected Chancellor. And uh, in that new position, I really needed some help. So I went to uh, Dr. Julia Eastman and asked her if she could uh, assign somebody to me so, to get me through this. <laughs> and uh, luckily, she assigned Morag. And uh, we actually, for the next six years, had a wonderful working partnership. She was uh, efficient, she was extremely supportive, and of course, she was kind. So, I just wanted to say that she was such a wonderful person and a big part of my life, like she probably has been for many of you. So, thank you, Morag. My name is Trudy Bennett, and in January of 2018, I attended my first membership committee meeting for the Yachtop here. And to my surprise and delight, I met three women at that meeting with whom I, I felt an instant rapport. Now, Joan had been around for a while, um, but Morag had only started in the fall, and Marna and I were both newbies that day. And the four of us found that we not only liked working together, but we liked having fun together as well. So we would meet for lunch and develop our, our friendship. I call this the Fab Four, and I think we really were. I'm really grateful that I didn't know how little time we'd have to be the Fab Four. But life has taught me that two real things about life and death is that we each of us have a finite number of days to live. And it's not nearly so important how many days we have as what we do with them. That's number two. And just by looking around and by listening to what I'm listening to, I realized that Morag was probably one of the most fascinating people I've ever met. If I was ever intended to grow up, I guess I'd want to be like her. She was the most inclusive person, just, just naturally, naturally inclusive. When I think of our lives, I think of us coming into this life as fully warped tapestry looms. And by that, I don't mean kinky. I mean that all the warp threads are in place. And as we go through life, all the people we come in contact with affix some of our woof threads to our tapestry. And that's what makes us who we are. All the interactions we've had with people all through our lives. I only knew Morick for a very short time. But I am assured, as I think back over our time together, that all the threads that she affixed to my tapestry 
were of bronze and copper and silver and gold and platinum so that she could fill it with as much light and love and laughter as she possibly could. I'd like to tell you that she had a wonderful influence on me and then I stopped offering barbed wire for my wolf threads, but I would be lying. <laughs> Anybody here would know that it wasn't true. I have to tell you that she's probably had more of a, an effect on me since she died than she did when she was alive, because I keep looking back and thinking how incredibly lucky I was. And, and somebody said it hurts, and, and it does. And, but damn it, it would hurt a lot more if you ever could think of your life of not having had her in your life. And so, I say thank you. I thank you, Morig. I thank you, Stephen, for letting us share in this today. And all of you that came, we in fact are her legacy. Every one of you that got a thread from Morig, you're the legacy. And it's, it's just an amazing, amazing honor. Thank you. My name is Doug Foster, and I'm here with a few friends of mine and uh, our fellowship that we call the Senate Peninsula Pipe Band. I haven't known or had the privilege of knowing Mareg uh, for as long as many people that are here, but I can tell you this much and share this. Um, she joined our band largely because she believed in music. She also believed in community, and she saw that in our band, because we do a lot of community performances. But from Rag, she was such an organizer. My goodness, the day that she became president, look out. <laughs> We're going to be organized. We're going to have policies and procedures, and we're going to conduct respectful meetings. <laughs> that was Marie. I loved her as a friend, as all my bandmates do. But she stood for something else, which we are in desperate need of, and that's young people. We're old papers, many of us, we have a few young ones, but she believes strongly in encouraging our youth to come and join the cause with us. And she was hugely promotional for women. We don't have enough of those. We've got a lot of old male codgers, but we, we've got a, we haven't got a balance of power here. But Mirag spoke for five people when she spoke. And uh, in spite of those of us that would push back, uh, at the end of the day, her logic and her warmth and her feelings uh, carried over with us. can't believe it. But there we have it. We have procedures, policies now, and we behave ourselves at meetings and are respectful. So we're grateful to be here today. And, you know, I think the young lady earlier summarized it best when she said that the grief is the price of love. But it also reminded me of the fact that grief, like anything else, shall pass. And in its place are the memories. Because for me, I think most of why I live today and the people I meet, and the impressions I leave, they're all about memories. So even though Mirag is not here with me anymore in person, the memory is going to live forever. And it seems to me that's, that's kind of why I exist. Is, and try to live the most every day because that's how I want people to remember me. So I thank the opportunity to come and speak on behalf of my fellowship and, uh, and play for us today for a good friend we call Mirag. Thank you. Thank you for all the beautiful comments about Morag. Uh, two of the comments in the last speaker, the one about policies and procedures, <laughs> and the one about young people really hit me. Um, my name is Katie Mature. I'm from the University of Victoria in the Department of Psychology. And I first met Morag back in the late 1970s when I was coming up from the University of Washington for a series of workshops that the university held in the summer. And even though I only saw her once a year, I always felt immediately recognized and welcomed um, and she made sure that those ran absolutely <laughs> on time and, and to the point. Um, and, she, and then I joined the faculty at the university. And I remember in one of my first visits with her, as I was you know, gathering my materials to teach my course, 
I went to Moray. The, um, someone said, I, I, I told them I needed some overheads. And they said, oh, you need to talk to Moray. So I went to Moray, and she said, well, how many do you need? And I said, well, I'd like a box. She said, oh, no, not a box. <laughs> that would not be our policy. Go back, count how many you think you need, and we will give you them. <laughs> Um, so she was very much with the institution in mind, but also incredibly warm and generous. Um, when you work at an institution like the university, it's really the relationships that make a difference. And everyone who passed through the University of uh, Victoria's Department of Psychology has amazing memories of, of Morig and how much she did to shape and uphold and support that department. She was particularly, um, the students were particularly important to her and every decision she made was really filtered through that lens of what would be good for our students. So um, I'll miss her dearly and I know many of my colleagues in psychology will. Thank you. So my name is Gina Hosey. Uh, my husband Sandy is in the pipe band and it's through that connection that I got to know Morag a little bit. Um, I played this song for her a couple of months ago. I think it was Easter weekend and uh, it was just a song that I picked because I thought she might like it. And when I finished playing, uh, she gave me that big smile of hers and she let me know it was one of her favorites. So I'm going to sing it for her again today and uh, I'd love to hear some other voices joining me. Oh, the summer time is coming And the trees are sweetly blooming Goes around the purple ever. Will you go? Start and lead us over to the memorial tree. <laughs> 